Okay, I think we got it. It's Thursday. It's been an incredible day, an incredible journey. And um, we are in week, wow, week six, seven with the, the shutdown and COVID-19. And our special guest today is none other than Earl Edwards, the athletic director from UC San Diego. So thank you so much for joining us. With me thank is my co-host, Alexis Dixon of Hello. Vision Solutions International. And we're joined again by Dr. Michael Gerson, who is uh, sometimes he highlights as my brother as well. So I'm going to um, just start out by saying, Earl, you have done so much work um, over the years to build an amazing athletic program at UCSD. And I think we are all in shock with COVID-19. Uh, you were on the brink of taking our fellow Triton to Division One, and now everything is, is frozen, and, and we just don't know what it's going to look like for you. I mean, as a fellow community builder, I know how much uh, blood, sweat, and tears goes into building a community, and that's what you've done on campus. So can you tell us what's going on? with uh, UC San Diego Athletics, while I also throw out my kitten, who I forgot to quarantine. <laughs> well, the first thing I'll say is to thank you for having me on this uh, program. And, and with the move to Division I in the fall, it's obviously going to be a, a very different uh, scenario for us as a campus. In fact, we're talking about uh, creating a new norm and when we go back, we are anticipating going back to campus in the fall. The chancellor has decided that we'll have a hybrid scenario, meaning some students will be virtually learning okay, and others okay. will be on campus. What that means for us as an athletic program is, is really up in the air because we really don't know what's going to happen when it comes to athletic competition starting in the fall. That can be anywhere from not having any competition to having competition with limited fans to having competition with no fans. So, so we're still working through all of those. The one, one thing I want to share with everyone that's listening is that we are extremely fortunate and blessed to be at UC San Diego because UC San Diego is on the cutting edge of addressing, addressing this COVID-19 scenarios with so just as one small example, the expectation is in the fall when the students and staff do come back, that everyone will be tested mm -hmm. and, re and tested uh, repeatedly. And with that being said, if we were at full swing, we're talking about 60,000 individuals. And we already have some uh, uh, testing uh, equipment that no one else has that is going to put us in its leading role nationally as well as internationally. So, so I'm excited about that. But there's a lot of question marks still regarding the uh, fall athletics. But we're expecting to have something. Right. And are you referring to the? They just came out with the campaign return or return, learn, learn. return and learn, learning to return. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's what return. you're referring to. Where they're yeah. going to start with the 5,000 students, test them. And then from there, roll out a plan. And it'll be, I think they say, for now, monthly. And we know this has been really fluid, agile learning for all of us. Um, go with the flow. So, okay, so that's the learning. Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. And when, I, and when we talk about the testing, we're so far ahead of everyone else. Because, as you know, if you've been following the uh, saga with the testing, that a lot of individuals or places can't get the testing, and it takes a while to do it, but because we have so much, so many experts here on our campus, not only do we have the testing, but you can get the results in the same day. So I'm expecting UC San Diego to be on the national and international forefront mm -hmm. as we move through this. 
What, what's the logistics that goes into this? Because there's a lot of uncertainty that's going to come in to play. I mean, you have to be prepared for a variety of scenarios. So what's kind of the internal logistics that, that's required to kind of prepare for who knows what? So departments that have never collaborated before, now collaborating? Um, are, are, I mean, and, and how does leadership emerge in a time like this? What's the new kind of leadership that's required? to bring about those logistics and be prepared for this uncertainty. Well, you, you hit on a number of uh, outstanding byproducts, I'll say, as a result of the COVID-19, those byproducts being the collaboration and communication across campus in a lot of different areas. So we're interacting quite a bit with the uh, health system and the uh, emergency uh, committee on, on the campus. So we're developing the protocol and the things that we need to do as we come back. I will say there's still a lot of uh, unknowns. And I believe whenever we get to the point, even with the return to learn as it's described, there'll still be some things that we uh, haven't addressed or be difficult to address. The most difficult piece is while we've uh, talked about what we're going to do for people on campus, when you talk about intercollegiate athletics as well as other things, you, you can imagine that we have a lot of non-campus individuals coming onto campus. So whether it's the teams, the officials, uh, other dignitaries, and that's where it's gonna be a lot more uh, complicated to uh, monitor this COVID-19 and what we're trying to do moving forward. But I would say that I feel really comfortable saying is that UC San Diego, the athletic department included, is in the forefront of developing and coming to a place that uh, we're all trying to get to. We'll be leaders in that in that regard. Mike, did you have anything? I see you. So I see the yeah. wheels turning. Alexis, I mean, he hit what I was. Uh, I was going to pull on that thread a little bit, and I was just really curious. Um, what leadership qualities have you had to really pull on um, because of COVID-19, which for the most part, you know, has been really sudden, unexpected, and pervasive? Well, I think the main thing was to enhance our communications across the board, because obviously when the contests were uh, eliminated in the spring, there was a direct impact with the scholar athletes. And I want to emphasize, we say scholar athletes. That's the term we'll use uh, moving forward because we do put a high value on the academic piece. We'll be able to do both. So the biggest thing was the communication. So the communication with the uh, scholar athletes, the communication with the uh, coaches, and then with my staff. So one of the first things we did, and I'm, I wasn't a Zoomer, like most of us, I'm sure. <laughs> and now you are. Now, now we all Zoom, 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 right? Yeah, the Zoomer. But one of the first things we did in terms of the leadership aspect was to pull my entire staff together and talk about where we are and what we anticipate doing moving forward. And I say anticipated because things kept evolving, but we talked to individuals on a regular basis. So. Having said that, my first Zoom was with 110 individuals. And, 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 not, and, and once we did the Zoom, it wasn't just about the plans moving forward, but to try to create some comfort level, meaning that while this is a challenge, while this is not the norm, when it's all said and done, we're going to end up in a much better place than we were before because of the enhanced communication as, and as uh, Alexis alluded to, the extreme collaboration across the campus, including athletics. Right. You know, M M Michael is a, a professor of sports psychology and as you're speaking, Earl, one of the things that strikes me is this is not just the kind of physical conditioning of athletes to get back in condition to perform physically, but the mental state, and as you talk about coming, becoming better as a result of this, that requires a new psychology. 
right? If mm -hmm. I'm an athlete, I, I have to tell myself a different story. I have to move into a new psychological place. You're a professional football player. I mean, you've won games, you've <laughs> lost games. You were 6'7", 280 pounds. I wouldn't, I'm really happy to meet you here and not on the football field. Because <laughs> soaking wet, I'm 175. <laughs> so you would have. But, you know, what's the psychology behind this? How do you get these athletes, these young kids, the scholar athletes? I love that word. And I'd love mm. you to talk more about why you are using that term that way. But what is psycho what's the psychology of getting them to come back and, and be better as a result of this? Well, there's a couple of points to that. One, uh, while they're off campus, we've developed through our athletic performance unit, which is probably one of the top ones in the country, a virtual conditioning program for the athletes that they can use during the interim. Now we all recognize that it's not at the level as if they were on campus, but it is something that they can do to, to help them stay somewhat in shape. Mm -hmm. We're also very fortunate that, you know, we're talking about sports psychology and I like to uh, uh, tie that into mental health in general, which mm -hmm. is a major issue for college campuses in general, but also within athletics. And I'm I'm extremely pleased to say that we've been on the forefront of mental health screening for our athletes. So it's, it's part of our uh, physicals when they come back to campus. And with that screening, it allows us to identify if some athletes have the potential for some mental health issues, mostly in the anxiety and depression area. And once that's identified, then we work with the campus counseling uh, group uh, as far as resources. So the psychology has been to work with the athletes through the uh, virtual aspect. And then we're doing things like, uh, if you go to our website, we're doing a section on our seniors called In Their Own Words. And what it, what it does, a good example, we had a tennis player and rowing athlete where their seasons were either cut short or never got started. Yeah. So they're writing articles, and I encourage you to, to check it out on our website, a little plug here. Where, yeah, where, let me know, and I'll try and pull it up on the screen. No, that, it's UCSDTritons.com. Uh, but that exercise has allowed the athletes to express their <laughs> frustration, their concerns with their seasons ending to reevaluate the role that athletics has played in their lives up to this point. So there's been a lot of reflection on their end. So I think the things like that that we're doing is helping the athletes from a psychology perspective. The bottom line though, is if you're an athlete, you want to get back on the field, you want to practice, you want to have that group uh, dynamics and that's what we're focusing on for the fall. And I should say, when we talk about UC San Diego athletics and we say the fall, for our athletes, that's August the 3rd versus October 2nd for the regular student. So while our athletes will be back a lot sooner, and I also think as a result of that, they'll be a part of the programs pilot or whatever that the university is doing for the students and staff as we try to address the COVID-19 environment. I know it was because at Bella Vista, like, we love you guys. We love UCSD athletics. And to speak to, you know, saying scholar athlete, when I, when I went to school in uh, 1996, when I landed at UCSD, one of the things they, they really pointed out was that there were no athletic scholarships. Right. And a lot of the, fo the focus was on academics. Um, so I think it is important for people that are watching to recognize that UCSD is a very, you know, rigorous school. I don't know how I got in there or graduated, slipped through the cracks. Um, but it's a very, it's a very difficult school to get into and, and very rigorous courses. Um, and we were super excited because you guys made it, our basketball team, right, made it to the playoffs. And then all of a sudden, we, as COVID was coming around the corner, it was, okay, we're going to play the game and you can come watch it. Then it was, 
guess what? No one can watch the games anymore. What does that do from a mental standpoint? Me being a, a former dancer, I mean, I hated rehearsals because there was no one in the audience. So I know that pain of trying to perform without be, being able to feed off of the energy of the crowd. How was it for the students? Well, we, we, we never got to the point where we actually participated with nobody in the stands. Okay. So what happened as the COVID-19 scenario was being analyzed, we did have one contest against Penn State, which we won. I have to throw that in there. Penn State <laughs> and men's, men's volleyball, where we had about 500 people at the contest. But at the contest, we practiced social distancing. So we had the seats you know, separated. We had uh, signs all over the place. We had the hand sanitizers available. So we've had a little practice if we move to the case of some fans and not like we had uh, yeah. in tradition. So that that was uh, difficult. But other than that, it was literally, and this was really hard for athletes, it was literally our teams get practicing for the NCAA playoffs, basketball, which we were hosting. As they're practicing, we had to say, this is done. We all have to leave. We had a women's basketball team in Hawaii that was getting ready to play as well. Mm. Basketball tournament, we had to tell them to jump on a plane and and leave. And swimming was the same in Indiana. And I could say in all of those cases, when the athletes were notified, there were a lot of tears and frustration at that moment. Because obviously with no warning whatsoever. So it's one of those uh, tough, uh, life lessons, if you will, that they've gone through. I think they've all grown from that as a as a result, and I think they'll be stronger in the long run because they had that unfortunate experience. Right. Um, with that being said, I mean, the media right now is super saturated with just suffering and stories of sadness. Uh, one, how are your athletes and coaches and staff doing? And then two, um, could you share some success stories, like just some some things to to lift people up and, and make us feel good about uh, you know some of our athletes overcoming or being resilient or reaching out to other people and and you know creating a community of strength? Well, I will say that uh, our athletes and our program in general, we've been very involved with the campus as a whole. And as a result of that, we've done a lot of things which I think are uplifting. A couple of examples would be the uh, virtual tour aspect that we did for the campus, talking about the athletic program and for the 16,000 or so people that uh, viewed it. Our athletes have done a number of fun videos that's <laughs> helped them get through this time. In fact, when I talk to the coaches about things they're doing with their athletes, my expectation was that they would be focusing just on athletics. But what I found was, to give you an example, was that one of our coaches had his athletes, our soccer athletes, get together with their parents to prepare a meal that they've done together. Nice. And, then, and then present that to the group. He went a step further and asked the athletes to write, how are they dealing with this adversity and what is it gonna do in terms of making them more resilient moving forward? And then the athlete was supposed to, which they did, ask their parents, what adverse adversity have you gone through or something really devastating that has helped you as a parent? And then they've had conversations about those two. Now, I think you would agree that those, those are things that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but it's, it's made the family closer, you know, because parents don't really get to interact much with their kids once they, uh, once they get to college. And it just made us think more about how do you deal with the crisis and what 
what can happen as you move forward. Because I believe when it comes to crisis or things like this, that's when your real leadership skills come out. Mm -hmm. That's when you really grow. Um, you don't want to have these things on a, a regular basis, but if you respond to it appropriately in terms of being positive, what can I get out of this? What have I learned? What can we do moving forward? Because, you know, when I talked about this, the Zooming and the virtual world, we've learned that there's many things that we've been forced to do now that we can continue to do moving forward, which we wouldn't have thought of if it wasn't for these circumstances. So i.e. a team can't take a strength and conditioning coach on the road because our budget doesn't allow it. Mm -hmm. Now we, we, you may not be able to take the coach, but the coach can certainly connect with you before games, after games to tell you what needs to be done. So right. there's been a lot of great things that have, that have come out of this unfortunate situation. I think one of the things you can do is you can give people an education. You can expose them to culture and the f refinements of life. But one of the things you can't give them is character. Character has to be earned. You have to go through the vicissitudes of life. You have to fall down and get up and fall down and get up. And you do that within a healthy ecosystem. The, 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 the degree of your resiliency, in part, is um, reflective of the ecosystem of people around you. And that's what I hear you talking about, that you have these athletes and character is portable, right? I mean, yeah. you, you need character on the court and you need character in life. And I love that the conditioning coach isn't with them, but yet there's a different kind of psychological character conditioning that's happening here. And I think it'd be interesting to see how that translates on the court. Well, you, Alexis, you hit on two, two things that are, are dear to my heart, and that is... Uh, when we look at our core values, one of them is resilience. And we've had to make that a part of our core value because at UC San Diego, we have some challenges that other schools don't have uh, when we were division two. So IE, whether it's the fact that you have to have at least a three, seven, three, eight or whatever before we even look at you. So academically that shrinks the pool. And then the other piece that uh, is dear to me is, I like to say that athletics is the laboratory for personal development. The games and competition, that's what people see, that's what they recognize. But what we really do as professionals is to develop the personal aspect of our athletes. So whether it's during the resilience aspect, whether it's the character aspect, whether it's the helping them with the difficult personal scenarios. There's a lot of things that we do that's out of the box of games and competition. And that's, that's what we really uh, focus on. And when you talk about character, not only are we building character, we make it a point that as we recruit, there's, I like to say we recruit by the ABCs. The A being the making sure the athlete can handle the academic rigors of our program because we are basically a public Ivy League. So we can't take in students that can't uh, uh, meet those academic requirements. The B is the best fit for our program or that particular team in terms of what their needs are. And then C, while I'm mentioning it as the third piece, it's not necessarily in that order. I just like the ABC approach. <laughs> the C would be for the character of the individuals. Because unfortunately for my end, I love what we do on the intercollegiate level, but I'm, I'm very comfortable saying that there's too often or too many places where the character piece is, is secondary to their athletic performance. And for us, it's character first, and then the athletic performance. Who helped you develop your character along the way? One of the things I read about you was that you went into retirement and Bart <laughs> Starr called you <laughs> out of retirement. <laughs> well, you're, okay, now, okay, I thought you were joking around earlier. 
but you're doing something that happens to me often, and that is I'm not the Earl Edwards that played in the NFL with Buffalo oh my gosh. and the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good night, everybody. Thank you. You're, you're tougher than that, right? You meant I did all that reading for nothing. But, but in spite but, of that. No, 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 no. Because in the spite number, of that. The number, um, the number of times that happens is, oh is my unbelievable. Gosh. So I, I won't be able to answer that, that particular question. And I was going to try to fake it, but there's too many people that actually know <laughs> <Yeah>. me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm reading this and I'm thinking, 6, 7, 260, he must have been a killing machine. Where did you, where did you get your character from? Who was, who was influence, influential in your life growing up? And, and how did that frame your, um, your life and, and, and your sense of character yeah. and place? Yeah, without question, it's, the first would be my parents. My my mother and my father were were very much into do the right thing, get an education, uh, t try to be a leader if you have those those uh, capabilities. The other part is uh, I've always been a big uh, follower of Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King, um, so following the different things that he's he's done. Uh, by no way was was I ever at the level of uh, doing things that he did to develop character, but the things that he talked about were very influential uh, with me as a, as a leader and my, and my ca character, which is, I like to say it's a very uh, positive uh, character. Uh, I think as a, uh, I'll, be, I'll be candid as a, uh, a black uh, individual in, in the US, if you don't have a positive uh, attitude, you'll, you'll drown. Um, so those things are the, the things that have influenced my personal character. Yeah, I'm hearing one of my favorite quotes, and, and I hear this in, in you know, uh, what you're saying and stating is that uh, leadership is not a trumpet call to self-importance, but it's the opportunity to serve. Um, and it sounds like you really embody and embrace that. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your leadership style? and what you hope to communicate to your yeah. coaches? That's, that's a great question. I, uh, I'll start off with this, which will be music to a lot of people's ear. I'm not a macro manager, micro manager. Mm -hmm. uh, I really believe that as a leader, you need to put together a staff that uh, understands your values, that are also experts in their particular arena and that they feel empowered to lead us or direct us in whatever area they're overseeing. So I believe in empowerment, but I also believe as a director, you can provide empowerment, but you still need to uh, provide guidelines, directions, uh, open up in terms of uh, different ideas. So one of the things I do as a leader when I hire different staffs or different members of my staff, I'm looking at it from a diversity perspective on two levels. One level would be diversity as most people think of it when it comes to race, uh, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation. But the other piece, which I believe is just as important, if not more, is diversity of ideas. So I make it very sure, very clear when I bring on new staff that you're not expected to, I describe it this way, you're not expected to think or be like me where I have a bunch of little Earls running around because <laughs> Earl thinks a certain way, Earl does things a certain way. And as a result of that, you're going to get a certain product. What I want to have is individuals that can bring new progressive ideas to the table to keep us in a position where we live up to one of my sayings, which my staff is probably tired of, and that is status quo is not acceptable. So the idea of always moving forward has to be in the forefront of what we do the only exception to the status 
quo uh, comment would be when it comes to policies and procedures or things that you have to do because that's that's the law or that's the rule. But the idea is every year you come back as a leader with new ideas to make us better. Who's got a dog? Do you have a dog on the beach there in the Caribbean on your island, Earl? <laughs> No, I'm outside. I'm in, the, I'm in my backyard and my neighbor's dog is barking. You know, Coach, when you talked about Martin Luther King, I wondered about your, a couple of things. One is, I'd love to know what made you say yes to your CSD. What made you initially want to come here? And then secondly, um, when you talked about Martin Luther King, I want you to also talk about your faith and how your faith plays a role in your leadership style. Okay. So the first thing as far as how, how did I get to UC San Diego? Uh, the first time, and I've actually been here on two different stints. I was here from 86 to 93 when we were a Division Three program. Then I came back in 2000 when we moved to Division Two. So the main reason when I first came was that the athletic director at that time, Judy Sweet, was a nationally re renowned athletic director within intercollegiate athletics. She was involved with a lot of NCA uh, committees and policies and procedures. In fact, she ended up being the only female president of the NCAA. So once, once I saw her bio, and I was actually in Pennsylvania or Massachusetts uh, during the winter time when it was 10 below zero, and I started thinking about, I need to get out of here. UC San Diego jumped to the forefront and then having uh, Judy Sweet as the athletic director uh, added to that. So I came in as the number two person. I left and came back in 2000 when they made the move to division two. And I never really wanted to leave, but Judy Sweet uh, didn't appear that she was gonna leave anytime soon. Uh, uh, during that time. So I came back when the position opened up and the university, which I was uh, pleased with, asked me if I wanted to come back and be the athletic director. <clears throat> and, and I always came back. One of my personal goals was to either end up at an athletic division one program or to move a program <laughs> to division one. And UC San Diego it was obvious to me that we should be division one with 30,000 plus students with the uh, caliber of our facilities, looking at the competition that we were competing against at the division two level, we needed to be in a position where we competed against like institutions like the UC uh, schools in the conference in the big west as well as the uh, state schools. As far as my uh, faith goes, I don't want to uh, give anyone the impression that I go to church every Sunday uh, and anything like that. But I, I will say that I do believe uh, in faith and I do believe that a lot of good things have happened to me personally uh, as a result of that uh, faith, uh, being positive, um, going to church periodically to get that uh, spiritual refuel, but it's more or less in believing that uh, I can do things in a good way if I just have faith in the man upstairs that'll help me to, to get to where I need to be. And I've been very fortunate uh, to be in a position, especially with the division one move. There were so many things that had to fall into place before we, got here, even though it took 18 years. Patience is a virtue. <laughs> uh, <you> know, <laughs> it's helped me a lot just being positive and looking at things from a positive lens. Earl, that was my question. So I went to UCSD from 96 to 2000. We just missed each other. And um, like you said, I think it was division two back then. We would perform for the basketball team at, you know, um, halftime and whatnot. And, and 
I never heard of any talk of going Division One. When when was this decision made? And would you consider yourself a bit of a visionary? Were you part of this vision and this decision to, to bring UCSD to Division One um, athletics? So the the evolution evolution of that discussion is uh, uh, interesting. I would say back in ninety five, two thousand and ninety five. Mm-hmm. We were uh, Division Three at that time, but we were having discussions because we were so large compared to Division Three. Got it. And the same with uh, Division Two. Those schools are generally a lot smaller. So we had some preliminary discussions in the uh, late 90s about moving to Division Two, and the issue became with the campus at that time, we made the move in 2000, was that we would make the move without scholarships, which was extremely uh, out of the box. (laughs) Because usually when you made the move, it was for scholarships, but the campus and the faculty were really concerned that if we had scholarships, we would move into this, uh, what I like to describe more of a business model versus an educational model of athletics. Um, So we made the move in 2000 without scholarships. And that's where the resilience again came in because we were competing against other schools that had scholarships. We did not have scholarships and we weren't able to allow other individuals uh, into our program as far as scholar athletes because of the academic standards. So I would say it started in the the late, the late 1990s, and then it became a real conversation roughly in 2015 when the students came to me and said, we love this university, it has a lot of great things, but we are missing that Division One experience. Yeah. And so it was the students that were the driving force behind us moving to Division One. that conversation starting in 2015 and they passed the the vote in 2016 for us to move to D- division one so it's been a, a long evolution and so now earl do how does funding work are there um sorry guys my kitty is making a cameo today it's this is just how we roll during quarantine <laughs> we just go with the flow um are there are there um, are student athletes getting scholarships or how how are you funding um, this move? I mean that's it's a lot bigger investment going to D one. What it, how is it funded and what are some of the exciting things that you had planned for going Division one? So I'm happy to say with the move to Division one, uh, the students voted to essentially tax themselves in terms of. Uh, funding for the program and then there's other resources that we have whether it's corporate partnerships or donors and so forth Mm -hmm. so where we are now we are a division one program that that's fully funded in several sports uh, similar to the uclas and some of the other programs so we we have scholarships in the big west that puts us at the same level as those institutions. And one thing that maybe individuals don't know, but when we talk about athletic scholarships, we have uh, using men's basketball and women's basketball as examples, we have the maximum number allowable of scholarships, just like UCLA and other schools in those sports, because it's a, a standard across the board. So we're funded primarily through uh, fees as well as donations and uh, corporate partnerships. And I think having gone to UCSD when there wasn't sports, I remember my parents saying, because we came, like my brother and I went to St. Joe's SJND in Alameda, and our, our high school was Division One state champ. So sports were a huge part of our life and our huge part of our childhood memories and really bringing communities together. And I feel at UCSD, everyone was so looking forward to finally having that experience and that athletic 
um, program and going D1 to bring the community together. Are you feeling sad or heartbroken or just like, oh, frustrated? Like, what are you feeling right now? Because it's like, you're so close and then bam, global pandemic. Oh, no, I'm, still, I'm still extremely excited okay. because what's happened with this uh, pandemic, it's, it's put us in a position where we're collaborating with a lot of people across campus, particularly the, the student groups. Uh, so they're excited with the move to uh, Division One. We all know or feel that this is a, a, a temporary scenario. And when, when I say temporary, using a baseball analogy, we're not sure if we're in the, the third inning or the seventh inning, but we know the ninth inning is coming. Uh, and I'm, I'm anticipating, and I could be uh, out of line with this, but I'll do it anyway. I'm anticipating that by the time we get to the winter quarter, mm -hmm. that we'll be at a place where the new norm for athletics will be in place. So I'm, I'm excited. I don't, I don't feel disappointed at all. In you're fact, strong. I'm, yeah. Like, <laughs> and you're, are you sure you're not the six, uh, six, seven, two, sixty? <laughs> you're like, <laughs> you're, the me. <laughs> you're amazing. Well, I'm the using... part, well, the other part of this is, you know, in retrospect, and we talk about it often, because of this pandemic, we've had the last five or six weeks to really delve into the things we need to do for moving to Division One. Yeah. And if you know anything about work, and which I'm sure we all do, you have your, your normal job and you have, let's say, 10 projects you want to get to, <laughs> which you never get to or you get to a couple just because of the other de demands. Now that we've had this free time, we've been able to really delve into what we need to do to be a successful program. It's clearly made us much closer as a, a department. And the university, I just heard today uh, from one of my staff members who's on the university communications team. And they were going through a SWOT analysis of the strengths and all that stuff mm -hmm. for the university as a whole. And the, the result of that SWOT analysis was, not the whole results, but the part we're talking about, yeah. was that athletics is a key factor to the university moving forward in terms of togetherness, yes. bringing the campus and the community together, the ability to tell the story of the university, which a lot of people don't know how great we are, but that's gonna change mm -hmm. shortly with this COVID-19. So I've been really uplifted. The only, the only part I have to say that's been a challenge, which is a challenge for all of us, is this uh, lack of, uh, of uh, normalcy in terms of just being able to drive to the beach and relax on the, right. on the beach or go to the, to, to the grocery store and be a normal environment or you know just hanging out with your friends and talking to your neighbors. That's been more of a challenge but we're all going through that and that's just part of what we have to deal with yeah hey earl um i was wondering um well i mean let me back up a little bit first of all i have a real uh soft spot for uh, scholar athletes student athletes being one a long time ago and i really understand uh the rigors and the hardships uh, but also the joy of Know, trying to maintain really good grades in the classroom and perform at a high level on the field. Um, but I really am concerned about today's athletes because they are just facing a whole new slew of mental challenges. You know, today's athletes, they grew up overscheduled. They face higher societal pressures to succeed with just stronger competition than ever before. You know, they communicate via smartphones. They deal with helicopter parents at times. And they grew up with uh, participation trophies as, as a norm. And this is, you know, in the mental health field, this has really led to lower mental uh, toughness skills, higher anxiety and stress, poor communication skills, relationship challenges, and performance struggles. And I really would love to see, you know, all students, especially your students, uh, scholar uh, students, 
uh, come out of this and live resilience and put that resiliency into action uh, as that's a part of a way you're empowering them. Yeah. Um, what other initiatives have you guys put into place to help our student athletes uh, transition uh, um, so they can come out of this on top? Well, I'd, I'd say there's a couple of things. I already mentioned the, uh, the mental health uh, screening uh, aspect, but we've actually gone a step further where we've developed a, an app for all of our athletes that really deals with how they're feeling on that particular day. And that app is uh, available to our coaches so that he or she knows where the coach is for that particular day. So, for example, if you were going to have a, a very stressful workout practice, maybe because of the app is telling you that people are, uh, are somewhat uh, drained because of finals, whatever, we'll do something different. The other piece I'll say is that we emphasize without question with all of our scholar athletes that we're more about preparing them to be self-reliant and, and part of the mainstream. So for example, while we will provide uh, some assistance with our scholar athletes when it comes to academic performance, we're not developing like you see at a lot of campuses an academic advising center strictly for the athletes. They have to work within the mainstream of the campus as a whole. Mm. We also, uh, we're not as much into uh, holding the hands of our athletes when it comes to they have an issue with a class or an exam. We're not gonna jump in there and talk to the professor on their behalf. They need to do that. So this issue of being self-reliant, I think the approach that we're using um, helps to prepare them for the future, but it also mitigates some of the things that you're talking about, which is, is spot on, the, the idea of holding their hand pretty much for everything that they do, and they don't have any uh, resilience as a, as a result of that. So we're very much into, and I'm to run a blank on the the, the term we use, but it's, it's in the line of our athletes have to be resilient and uh, are somewhat independent on things they need to do in campus as well as moving forward. Did I answer your question, Mike? Yes, you perfectly. Thank you. Uh, are you always this calm and composed? <laughs> Can you? I'm like I can't sit in chairs. These yeah. Zoom calls all day. I, mean, I think one of the marks of a great leader, if you don't, you know, I, I tend yeah. to be flowery, so forgive me. But I think one of the one of the marks of a great leader is modeling that he holds himself to the standard that he is demanding of mm -hmm. his right of his ecosystem, of his leadership, mm -hmm. of his athletes. And I'm just listening to you speak over the last hour we've been together, and there's such congruence, such congruence in what you're saying that you're asking others to do and you seem to model that yourself. Can you speak to that a little bit, please? Yeah, that's, uh, that's something I've heard often because as you can imagine as an athletic director, whether it's this COVID-19 or some other crisis that we have to deal with, mm -hmm. that people say that. I just think it's just part of my personality because I've always felt that if you demonstrate uh, anxiety, anxiety or you've mm -hmm. lost it, that you're, you're, it makes it hard to follow someone yeah. that, that does that. So it's just been part of my uh, upbringing and personality for, for quite some time. I've found that it's it's been extremely helpful as a leader, but I will say without question that while the outward appearance is very uh, calm and collective, <laughs> internally there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you from the John? Are you from the John Wooden School of Leadership? John Wooden used to say with UCLA, used to talk about not getting too high, 
and mm-hmm. not getting too low. You don't, oh, you don't celebrate the successes and you don't, yeah. you know, you don't wall. Are you from that school of, of thought and leadership yeah. also? I would say without question. And actually, uh, John Wooding is one of those other individuals that, uh, you know, I've read a couple of his books and my son went to UCLA, so he got the wooden indoctrination as a soccer player. Uh, yeah, so I'm definitely in that that frame of mind that, you know, you don't want to be too high, you don't want to be too low. There are times, I will have to say, uh, where I demonstrate some real excitement, i.e. when the referendum was passed for the move to Division One, I jumped and screamed like I never had before. <laughs> do you have footage of that? Do you have any footage? Can we, no, can we see that? That's, that's a good question. I don't think we do. <laughs> I, I can look into that, though. Well, we miss you. We're so thankful for your time. Mike, did you, do- or Dr. Gerson, did you have another question? or? No, I mean, I have many other questions, but it seems I like... Know. Well, I know. Guess- definitely. You know, I just want to end it for me um, that thank you. This has been a real pleasure. I, I've learned a lot. Um, you know, through this uh, communication. The first is, you know, don't be an expert. Surround yourself with other people who are more expert than you. Um, Empowerment and innovation and creativity. And we saw that, you know, uh, you live it, you preach it. And then these coaches are coming up with these creative, innovative ideas about cooking meals with, uh, you know, and and asking their parents, you know, uh, time where they overcame adversity mm-hmm. and then this idea of self-reliance and, and not holding hands um, but uh, allowing people some space to make mistakes and learn from it and um, yeah I, I, I love it all and I appreciate it. Yeah. Fantastic. Up, Alexis? No. Um, just, the, just the idea that in this moment you know I think we're oftentimes invited by the moment and I think this moment appears to have invited all of us to do something. And what I heard very much like Dr. Dr. Gerson, <laughs> Mike, <laughs> um, is that you've taken this moment, your invitation you've accepted from this moment is to build a community through, mm-hmm. th- through this moment, right? Through your, through, your, through your athletes, through your coaches, through their families. You've actually created a community of integrity and character that's portable, that will certainly translate onto the, onto the court and into the, into the fields and all that. So um, I love the fact that you've taken this moment to, to, to build communities, to breathe life into, uh, you know, our, our confrontation with our, with our mortality. So, you know, like Mike, I learned quite a bit from you. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I want to say as far as the athletic program, and yes, I'm the athletic director, but I'm extremely, extremely blessed to have a phenomenal staff that's doing great work during this time period and without the staff, and this isn't a uh, cliche statement because I know for sure, especially now, looking at all the work and all the detail that's going into getting us to a better place that um, I couldn't do it without the phenomenal staff that I have across the board as well as scholar athletes. So, so thank you for having me and uh, it would be nice to do this again when there's some actual games and the results and, and things we could talk about. So Absolutely. thank you very much. And thank you, Earl. We miss you. Um, I miss seeing all the coaches, all the players that used to cross the street and come over and, and hear about the latest and the games. And we're all going to get back there so, sooner than later. And um, just thank you for your leadership and for, like, like everyone was saying, for keeping the community together because we need leaders like yourself, especially in this time of crazy uncertainty. So thank you all very much for tuning in to Bella V TV. Um, Lots of other great interviews coming up moving forward. And you can subscribe to the YouTube channel, Bella V TV. You can like us, you can share the love and we'll see you all soon. Thanks again, Earl. Thank you, Earl. Thank you. Bye.